I speak in the name of the one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue this week with our look at the book of Hebrews, one of the most fascinating, though often underappreciated, texts of the New Testament. This anonymous first century book is uh, written to a community that was shrinking in numbers and being persecuted. The author sought to reassure and encourage this church. He accomplished this uh, with some real pastoral insight through a review of the faith. He argued that Christ is God's son. Christ is a Messiah king, and in this passage, Christ is a high priest. That can be a bit confusing. We don't have any experiences with the old high priesthood of the temple days. No one has for the last 2,000 years. The cultic high priesthood of Aaron, the brother of Moses, can be a bit obscure to us, but it was central to the way that Judaism was practiced for the first thousand years of its existence. Hebrews chapter 5 began with a review of this high priesthood. The priesthood is chosen among mortals. Regular people were priests and high priests. There is nothing particularly special about them in themselves. Uh, they were just chosen for that purpose. Their job was to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins, as detailed in the book of Leviticus, which I'm sure you all have memorized. Uh, a good priest is meant to be gentle. This gentleness uh, in the Greek cultic language found in the Septuagint, the widely read uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, is related to bowing. Gentleness comes from a spirit of humility. The priest has weakness, has sin. Aaron offered sacrifices on behalf of others, yes, but also on behalf of himself. He needed prayers as much as anybody did. Uh, he certainly made mistakes and was aware of them. And our own version of the common priesthood found in Christianity one of which I am, uh, the priest at the end of private confession states, as written in the Book of Common Prayer 1979, go in peace and pray for me, a sinner. The mortal high priest of old was chosen by the people and by God to offer sacrifices and to also be gentle with those who were ignorant and foolish, those who did not have their acts together in general. The priest could do this because he himself had faults and could understand weakness through his own frailties. Humility is a great religious virtue and is critical for spiritual leaders. The advice given in Hebrews is a good one. Leaders must be gentle and merciful with a spirit of humility. A great way of achieving this is by reflecting on one's own life. No human is as simple as the sweet love of family with the occasional silly and cute foible that you might see on a suburban social media post. Another way of saying this might be that even Instagram models don't have Instagram model lives. It's, it's phony. We all have our faults. We all have our shortcomings and failures. Hebrews advise to be gentle to the ignorant, but also to the wayward. And I love that descriptive term. Wayward people um, might be unmanageable or, or unorganized, but the word can also have a physical sense to it. The priest it needs to be gentle to those who might be lost, who don't even realize they're lost who might not know where they're going or what they're doing. The priest was called by God. The high priest or the common priest did not take the privilege for himself, but was called by the Lord, just as Aaron was. 
The author of Hebrews was a proud and devout Christian, but you will notice here that he does not disparage the Jewish faith. I have been saddened over these past few years to see the increase in anti-Semitism, uh, and we uh, have seen it in both conservative and progressive political groups. Uh, we Christians need to stand up against anti-Semitism and point to the ways that early Christians from biblical times were not anti-Jewish. Uh, Hebrews did not belittle the priesthood of Aaron. Aaron was an imperfect man uh, who you could justly criticize, but the authors of Hebrews do not, does not disparage him. Uh, he did not devalue the idea of the temple priesthood. There was nothing illegitimate about it. Jesus was just doing a new thing. The temple was transferring from a physical place where one could go and stand and worship to the very person of Jesus the Christ. This is the temple that would be destroyed in three days. It would be destroyed and in three days would be lifted up as Jesus taught in Mark. This new temple requires a different type of priest. This new priesthood was part of the Messiah's duty and call. Like many early Christians, the writer of Hebrews looked to Psalm 110 for the role of the Messiah. He quoted the well-known first verse that pointed out that the Messiah is to be the Lord, the Son. Uh, but he also quoted the fourth verse, that the Messiah is a priest forever by the order of Melchizedek. Of course he is. How, isn't that obvious to you all? No, most of us read that and go, what in the world is he talking about? You know, that is very strange. Melchizedek um, is also way too hard to pronounce. Um, so what does this mean? Melchizedek appeared in Genesis 14. Uh, he is the king of Salem, which means king of peace. Uh, he has also, uh, he was also a priest of what is called of the Most High God. Uh, he received a tithe from Abram, who is not yet Abraham, and Melchizedek blessed him. I don't think it is worth our time to try to guess anything more about Melchizedek. He is a figure barely mentioned in scripture who lived thousands of years ago. The point is, is that the Messiah is an order of priests like Melchizedek, which was a different order of priests that predated the Aaronic priesthood. Christ is simply a different kind of priest for a different kind of temple. What does this high priest look like? It is the very life and person of Christ. Jesus prayed frequently. He experienced suffering, not, and not just at the end of his life, but he experienced all the problems, inconveniences, and pains of a human life. Hebrews saw clearly that Jesus' earthly experiences were needed for him to be a perfect high priest. These experiences and this suffering made Jesus that perfect high priest, meaning that he was complete, whole. Nothing was outside of his scope. These experiences with real people informed his prayer life. When he offers prayers to the Father, he knows of what he speaks. It is not theoretical knowledge, but one born of hard experience. The bishop theologian N.T. Wright offered an extended metaphor uh, to try to explain this. One of a child who was going to take over a family business. One approach would be for that person to go to college and then come to a corner office, follow his parents around for a while, and then take over. Another approach would be to have that child learn the business from the bottom up. If they were making widgets, the uh, child could go to the mine where the metal was sourced, visit the steel plant where the metal was smelted, work on the factory floor to gain an understanding of what it takes to make a widget and gain an appreciation for the people who do the work. Then the child could go out with the sales team 
and uh, see what it takes to convince others to buy the widgets, which may have been tricky because I've never understood what a widget was, but they're all over economic textbooks, so it must be important. Uh, both approaches would lead to the result that the child taking that the child would take over the family business, but the paths were different. If you were to be judged, or if you needed someone to pray for you, would you not want that person to really understand what it is like to be you? Wouldn't you want them to understand your feelings, your doubts, the way that you suffer, the ways that you thrive? Would you not want that person to see how you live your life, what and who you love, and what is important to you? Jesus wanted to be all of this by living a real human existence with all of its challenges, joys, and burdens. Jesus comes to the role of high priest with a fuller, complete understanding. This allows us to say with the author of Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews, through teaching the faith, is at the same time addressing the pastoral concerns of the congregation. The church was in trouble. It was shrinking. There was persecution. The author understood this, and so did Jesus. The Messiah understood the struggles that they were having. He understood the pain of seeing a crumbling institution that they loved. But all was not lost to them. Their church, as our church, as the pioneer and perfecter of the faith in Jesus Christ. I do not think that modern Christians spend a lot of time thinking about how Jesus prays for them, but I think we should. So I'll leave you with a few questions. What do you think Jesus' prayer for you is? What is Jesus' prayer for the Episcopal Church? What is Jesus' prayer for the Church of the Advent in Medfield? What do you think Jesus's, Jesus wants you to experience in order to understand something more fully? And lastly, how can we be made more whole as Jesus is whole. In his holy name we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to be praying the litany for healing. Uh, St. Luke, uh, tradition teaches us, not only uh, wrote uh, the Gospel of St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, which teaches about uh, the life of the early church, but he was a physician, and, uh, and we pray for all uh, people in the medical field. It has been a really hard year and a half, um, so we will lift them up in prayer today with this litany of healing. Luke was also an artist, uh, and by tradition was the first one to paint a Christian icon. And uh, just downstairs in Children's Chapel earlier today, uh, I was speaking with uh, the kids and they were sharing uh, what they loved uh, about painting or drawing or using markers. Um, it is a way that we participate uh, in the life of God because God was such a creator that we are called to create. And, uh, and Luke also did that.